Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See detail. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether, and I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being, and because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Good morning, crypto. Fuels division more than Elizabeth Warren. But after 12 years, she's passed only one bill. She's completely absent, focused on hyper-partisan politics and advancing her own national ambitions. Now tonight, Senator Warren's campaign coming out with a statement essentially saying a small handful of crypto billionaires chose Dean for this race and poured millions, in fact, into the campaign. Now, Warren also said in that statement, the campaign manager said she has agreed to two debates. Deaton came out and wants her to agree to five single-issue debates, issues like reproductive rights, the migrant and immigration crisis, and also inflation among them. We're live here in Boston. Good morning, Warriors. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of your favorite crypto news channel, Good Morning Crypto, where we bring you the most relevant and impactful crypto-related topics from a top crypto research team in the world. And today, we've got a very special guest. James, aka Meta Lawman, is in the building. We're going to be discussing some of the Ripple developments, but to set the tone for today, I wanted to celebrate the John Deaton win. So first of all, Gonzo, how are you feeling this morning? And thank you for being here. I'm feeling great, man. I had a really good night last night. It was my daughter's birthday, so we took her out to dinner. So it was nice to spend time with family. Super excited to be here. Uh, anytime we get um, people like uh, James, Metal Lawman, and uh, Fred that are attorneys and I kind of know the actual intricacies of everything, you know, we always read stuff and we research and we kind of give our opinion, but getting a subject matter expert on the show is always awesome. So I'm sure it's going to be a great show. It's going to be a great show, James. And we didn't have to do much preparing. The articles pretty much prepared themselves this morning just to give our listeners a little bit of insight into what happened last night. John Deaton officially won the Republican primary in the Massachusetts election. Senator Warren has already agreed to two debates in October. John Deaton responded by asking for five single issue debates. And what I think is most important, he received 65 percent of the votes last night. So that's pretty exciting. First of all, James, I know you were at the event. How was the event? What was what were some of the vibes there? What was the reaction? How was the crowd? And how are you feeling this morning? It was fantastic. It, a really, really spectacular, upbeat vibe. Everybody there, so happy. Yeah, I'm re- I'm recovering now. I'm, I'm doing some hydrating here in my hotel in Boston. Uh, the venue was right in the TD Garden facility. It was a spectacular venue. 
uh, open bar, great food, and just uh, people connecting, you know, who all have this one thing in common. And we love John Deaton and what he stands for. And uh, we had a sense that he was going to win, but this margin of victory was really kind of mind blowing. Uh, I think he's finishing around 65% uh, of the vote. Um, and if you think about it, nobody knew him three months ago. And he's running against an elected official uh, on the Quincy City Council uh, and a longtime Republican figure in Massachusetts politics. It's well known. And John just came out of nowhere and connected with people. And we, you, you've seen it. We've all seen how he does it. It's amazing. People are really, really attracted to him. You see strangers come up to John and hug him. And the reason they're hugging him is they've read the book or they've heard about his story. And it doesn't matter if they're a liberal or a libertarian or a conservative or moderate or whatever else there might be out there. It does not matter. People resonate with John and what he stands for. And I tweeted out uh, last night, the American dream is alive and well, and his name is John Deaton. Um, and so it's so easy to get a little bit pessimistic. I'm a lawyer. We're a little bit of a cynical crew. But when you see the voters of the state of Massachusetts get it so right, it renews your belief in our system, in our democracy, that the right guy won and the right guy who can make a difference and stand for freedom you know, is now given a chance against a really, really tough established target in, in Elizabeth Warren. But man, the night was thrilling. John's daughter gave a spectacular speech. His grown daughter, a recent college graduate, she was fantastic. John was really, really on point, bringing in his personal story and explaining to people it's not a slogan that he represents the American dream. Let me give you the facts of what happened here. And growing up from just terrible poverty, you guys know the story and abuse and just the worst possible condition you can imagine and just fighting his way out of it, you know, into the, into the Marine Corps and just working his way through college and law school and becoming a successful, successful guy. Um, it's just thrilling, honestly, to see democracy in work, at work and see the right guy uh, being supported so thoroughly by the people of Massachusetts. I completely agree with you. And you brought up the American dream. So I got to address it before we get into our crypto content for today, guys. We already got a thousand live listeners here joining us. First of all, a special thank you to Meta Lawman for making time for us this morning. We are going to be going over the resolution of the Ripple lawsuit. But before we even get into that, the thing I'd like to address is the American dream, because just 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was a promise in this country. If you went to school, you did well, you followed the rules, you were going to have a good life. You were going to make enough money to not only start a family, get a home, afford a car, be proud of who you are. Well, it seems like over these last 10, maybe even five years, that dream has died. And I know it's a strong statement, but as somebody who's in their 20s, James, you said you have kids as well. When you're thinking about the next 20 or 30 years and the policies that are being passed today, sustainable is not the word that comes to mind. So I did want to get your thoughts on the American dream. Do you believe the American dream is still alive? And what would you say to somebody who, who hasn't officially made it, is looking at the country and trying to figure out where can I start the next 15, 20 years of my life? What's the message that you would send to those people? Um, I think the American dream is at risk right now. Uh, and if we don't pivot to common sense policies, there, there is a risk that it could simply fade away. And those of us who have benefited uh, from the opportunity that is represented by this term we use as American dream may, may very well be the last generation. I mean, I did not grow up wealthy at all. I grew up in, in Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, I tell people that we were middle class by Arkansas standards, which is not <laughs> middle class by uh, a lot of other places standards. Uh, you know, and I, like John, I had to borrow and work my way through college and law school, and I paid back my student loans. I had a huge amount of loans. I got married after law school, and my wife and I hadn't really talked about what my financial picture <laughs> looked like. And so she took two jobs, you know, and I worked 
very, very hard, you know, as a young lawyer, and we just paid off our loans as, as fast as we could. Um, but anyway, I, I've got a nephew right here in Boston who's got a great job. His girlfriend has a great job. They can't afford a house um, yet, you know, and it's like, well, how many years uh, of savings would it take? And I'm, and they've got really good jobs. Uh, and so people, you know, in the, in the middle class and in the working class um, are, are really wondering what has happened here um, and, you know, their ability to save uh, for the future and save for their kids, college to contribute to that and all of these things is deteriorating very rapidly. Um, and there's a lot of big forces at work, inflation, primary one. Um, and when you have a candidate or an, a, a sitting senator saying that the reason people are, are being priced out of everything, the housing market, buying their meds even, uh, is uh, price gouging. Uh, when we all know what it really is, I mean, I have, I have my degree, my undergrad degree was in economics, but you don't need an, a degree in economics to know what causes inflation. The currency is being inflated by excessive government spending. And when you're financing by more and more and more debt every year, um, the value of the dollars goes down. It's very simple. And the good news is that the people aren't buying this idea that suddenly uh, a bunch of companies decided to price gouge. They're not buying it. They know the reality that the government is in a sense, taxing them through this excessive inflation. And it's not going to be an easy thing to tackle. It's going to be a hard thing to tackle, but we better start or there will be no American dream except for the top 1% of people in this country. And John has said, he's not, you know, not on my watch. Am I going to let this American dream die? And uh, we we trust him. It's going to be hard, but we know he's a Marine and he's going to fight for what's right. And that's that's exactly what we need. I think what's so exciting is that a lot of people have addressed and this is a personal thing, too. I didn't think that somebody like a John Deaton had the possibility of getting elected. And that just shows my naivete. Right. That I didn't understand that a good person with good. Uh, I don't know if I'd call them objectives or initiatives. But the idea here is that he's a man of the people. He's a Marine. He's an everyday family man. He grew up in Detroit. He's not one of these elite politicians who's got 35 years of U.S. politics on his belt. No, he's just like us. He's at least as similar as we're going to get. And that's why I've been such a strong advocate of him on our channel. Anybody who watches this show every day knows I grew up in Boston. This issue hits home for me. So I'm very excited for John Deaton winning the primaries. And we're going to continue to cover this topic on the show. But we're already 10 minutes into this episode, and I got to get James' opinion on the SEC versus Ripple resolution, guys. And we already got 1,322 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Once again, a special thank you to Metal Lawman for joining us this morning. So, James, one of the things I did want to address right off the bat when it comes to the resolution of the Ripple lawsuit is the issue of an appeal. Because I think a lot of people have had that open debate on their channels, and I want to go to the experts, which is, of course, you, what is the incentive for the SEC to appeal? And what do you think the chances are that that happens over these next couple of weeks? I think there's about 40 days left for that to happen. Look, this is a toughie. You know, uh, I, I got on social media less than two years ago, and I had no idea that the only thing people wanted to know from a lawyer was what is going to happen in this case. That's the only thing people are interested. They're interested in two things, that and when is that going to happen? When is the judge going to render this opinion? And uh, we don't actually have those answers. Now, we do have experience of seeing cases, but I'll tell you, this one is, is very, very unusual. The way that Ripple fought this case is very unusual, you know, put on just a tremendous battle, you know, aided, of course, by John Deaton and all of his great work on behalf of the XRP owners. So shout out to John and all those XRP people who, who signed up, you know, to raise their hand and say, hey, please, judge, stop, stop the SEC. I know they say their mission is to help us. They're not helping. They're hurting us. Please stop. Um, that's really unusual. I'm not sure I have ever seen that 
at that scale of tens of thousands of people. Just an amazing uh, fight that uh, Ripple and and their lawyers and John uh, put up, and, and they are to be commended because it really, you know, led the way. You know, they were the pioneers, and and uh, others have followed. You know, normally you don't hear, "Hey, yeah, we just got a Wells notice, but we're going to fight the." bastards you know all the way uh that's not normal you know so um kudos to to garlinghouse and and larson and Stu alderati and all of them anyway your question are they going to appeal um it's a close it's a close call and there are so many pieces to the puzzle this is a i'm now mixing metaphors this is a chess game you know if i do this they're going to do that and that could have this consequence um, so, uh, you know, bottom line, I guess that's what you want to hear. I think it's slightly more likely than not that they will appeal. And I fully understand what the, you know, XRP people rightly point out that there's a risk that, you know, Judge Torres is upheld by the second circuit. And then it becomes an official precedent that binds all of the uh, federal courts within the second circuit and the second circuit is you know no offense to the others the most important circuit and so um there's a big risk that the sec will lose in that particular determination that xrp itself is not a security um uh you know could become uh precedent that other courts must follow you know so even the you know, some of them that are outliers like Jed Rakoff, who I've appeared before, and I predicted that he would do something different before he even had a crypto case. Uh, and, and he did he did exactly that. He's he's kind of a cantankerous guy. Um, but in any event, my guess is that it's slightly more likely than not that they will appeal. And if they do appeal, they'll appeal two things. Um, the first one um, is what we just talked about, that the XRP trading in the second mark, secondary market is not a security. They really need to undo that uh, because it is a, you know, a persuasive statement of the rationale for that finding by Judge Torres. So you've seen judges uh, in Binance and in Kraken align themselves with Judge Torres on this point, the the token in and of itself cannot be a security. And, uh, you know, when she ruled that when Garlinghouse and Larson sell their XRP on an exchange, that's not a securities transaction. That's a signal that it just simply uh, secondary sales are not um, trades of securities. And that's huge, hugely important, not just to XRP, but to the entire crypto world. And so that's a problem. Uh, for the SEC that you've got Binance and Kraken and other judges saying, you know, what the way she worked through that question makes a lot of sense. I'm going to follow that. The second thing is almost larger. It's certainly larger than the crypto industry is this determination that they didn't get any disgorgement whatsoever because they failed to prove that there were any losses um, from the sales of contracts. Uh, the you know contractual sales to institutions of XRP and those sales through uh, ODL uh, the ODL program um, they got no disgorgement because they couldn't come up with a single person that had lost any money that um, see that's new uh, that was not the law for my entire career the law changed within the Second Circuit in the fourth quarter of um, 2023 to say you must, you, the SEC must show losses. And so that's a big change and it's really a problem because when I was practicing law, that was one of the biggest threats the SEC had is you're gonna have to pay this enormous disgorgement if you don't settle. And now um, that's taken away. And so the only way they can get that undone is to go to the US Supreme Court. I know XR people, people don't wanna hear that, two more years, but since the Second Circuit has already ruled that you must show losses, the SEC must show losses in order to get in 
disgorgement. They're going to get that same ruling at the SEC and then have to take it to the Supreme Court, where I believe they'll lose. You know, so um, anyway, there's a lot of risk um, associated here. But let's not forget, guys, they did try to take an interlocutory appeal in the middle of the case after the summary judgment because they were so horrified by the determination that XRP is not a security, uh, that they were very worried that it would impact their entire, um, you know, uh, litigate, uh, regulation by enforcement program to have that case out there. So they asked to appeal it immediately to the second circuit. So let's remember that was their mindset not so long ago. And so that's one of the reasons I think it's slightly more likely than not that they'll appeal. And then last thing I'll say on this is there is a politics dimension to all of this. And it and it, I think it relates maybe too to a little bit to open C as well. You know, if you open up a bunch of cases, that's entirely possible Gary Gary Gensler isn't gonna be around to deal with them, you know. And so you could set up a situation where you start an appeal, you start a case against open C and do all of these crazy things. And then if there is a change in administration, the next administration just dismisses the cases, um, then, you know, the anti-crypto army, whatever, is going to say, oh, wow, here we go. All that money that was contributed, you know, in that election cycle is paying off as the SEC now drops these cases. So th it's kind of a setup, uh, possibly. Uh, when you when you start bringing these cases at the end of your tenure as a as a SEC chairman, that uh, there, there might be a little bit more to it than just the merits of, of the legal issues. And I did have a video from CNBC yesterday where I believe it was Paul Gruel, one of the lead lawyers for Coinbase. He stated that both the Trump campaign and the Harris campaign have made calls to discuss progressive crypto policy. Now, Trump's campaign has been more open to the idea of working and building on these technologies, where the Harris campaign was asking more inquisitive questions, trying to learn about the tech, discuss what it really means. So they weren't in the phase of actually creating regulation and taking action. They're still supposedly learning about this tech in the background. That's very important to note. But we did get a live update here, James. So I did want to get your thoughts on this. James K. Phelan. So both of the biggest lawyers in this space here, guys, for all of our live listeners are James. If you want your son to be a lawyer, name him James. That's what I'm taking away from this. Ripple has filed a letter requesting a stay of the monetary portion of the court's judgment, which was entered on August 7th of 2024. The SEC has consented to their request for a stay. So James, I'd love to get your live reaction. I can read that one more time. Hopefully it did make sense. Ripple has filed a letter requesting a stay of the monetary portion of the court's judgment, which was entered on August 7th of 2024. The SEC has consented to the request for a stay. So for all of us simpletons here, James, can you please explain what that means? And does that change any of the things that you just stated just a moment prior? I I got to say, I think it makes it a little bit more likely that there's going to be an appeal. Uh, because if the SEC had already decided that they're not going to appeal, then they would just say, no, go ahead and pay. Pay us. This case is done. So the only two possibilities now are that they are undecided or they have decided to appeal based on what you just read uh, to me. And uh, typically when you have a large judgment like this, um, you, you request a stay um, to pay it. Or, and if that's denied, then sometimes you can use what's called an appeal bond. You don't have to write a check for $125 million. You can get a bond uh, uh, for, you know, a tiny fraction of that that will pay in the event you lose uh, on appeal. Um, so it feels to me like a signal that they're more likely to appeal. Well, I can hear the frustration coming through the live chat right now, guys. Don't shoot the messenger, as they say, right, James? So James is not an advocate for an appeal. He's just dropping truth bombs this morning. And Gonzo, I want to give you a chance to comment, maybe ask James a question, and then I'll continue with some of the topics that we have prepared. Well, and, you know, as the trader of the group, uh, you know, and we talked about this before, the whole thing, when the initial lawsuit happened and the price crashed down, and we still made a high, right, an all-time high. And so I, I get that people are going to get frustrated. And, and I've always like leaned to, I'm not a lawyer. So whether they appeal or they don't appeal, I can't control. What I can control is what I do. 
with my investment, right? And so I'm of the opinion that even though people are going to get all upset, that even if they do appeal, like it's still going to be Bitcoin show, Bitcoin breaks its all time high and the rest of the market will move up. So eventually XRP is going to move up and it's going to move up probably close to its all time high. That's just my prediction. We'll see how that plays out. James, I did want to ask you. So one of the things that a lot of people have said is the SEC wouldn't be willing to appeal because it could be used as president in other cases. Maybe you can elaborate on that. So what are some of the incentives for the SEC to appeal versus the incentives for them to just wrap this thing up, maybe even consider it a win and move forward? Yeah, I've heard that a lot. And it's absolutely true. I mean, right now, the Torres decision is is what we call persuasive authority, meaning it's worth reading. You know, and if it makes sense, a judge might follow it. This is a very different concept from a binding precedent. So the Second Circuit decision would be a binding precedent. Um, and so that is that's the calculus here. That That is the gamble that the SEC is trying to work out. What are the odds that we lose? You know, and the and the Second Circuit rules. Yes, Torres was exactly right that these tokens are not securities. Uh, and by the way, one thing we haven't talked about is in the event of appeal, it's highly likely that um, Ripple would cross appeal um, and they would cross appeal on the grounds that the uh, the sales to the institutions and through ODL were, were not uh, investment contracts, were not securities. Um, and so therefore, you know, there should be a zero verdict instead of a $125 million penalty. Um, and so that's the other risk that the SEC runs is that, you know, is that how likely is that? And what's a little weird here is um, get, normally the chairman of the SEC is a really, really smart lawyer. Gary Gensler's not a lawyer at all. So he ultimately is going to make this call based on what the lawyers at the SEC tell him, you know, the general counsel at the SEC and then the head of the division of enforcement um, will both, you know, talk to him about what are the odds and what are the risks. But to answer your question, a binding precedent in the second circuit is a very big problem for the SEC if they do not win. But if they do win and the, and the second circuit rules that, tokens traded on the secondary market are securities that would upend the entire crypto industry. Wow. Um, you know, that even though it only covers the second circuit, you know, that's New York and, um, states North of there. Uh, it, it would be big trouble, you know, for the crypto industry. So what you'll see if there's an appeal is massive amicus briefs from, from all corners. Uh, of the industry, uh, trying to make sure that that, you know, doomsday scenario does not happen. So I'm going to cover two quick topics and we got our friend Johnny Crypto joining us, guys. So thank you so much to Johnny. Fred Rispoli just put this out on his Twitter and our listeners asked in the live chat, James, explain it to me like I'm five. This is the kindergarten version, uh, according to Fred Rispoli. So Ripple stated, we have a check ready. Are you appealing this or not to the SEC? The SEC states, we can't tell you. It's kind of like our crypto policy if you want to talk about it. Ripple states, we will collect all interest from you. If we pay you, you appeal and we win. The SEC, let's enter an appropriate stay order. Then we'll get back to you. So I think that was pretty funny there, James. Well, another thing that I did want to address was the, the case precedent. You broke down a couple of the differences of whether the SEC would appeal or not. I do want to get your thoughts on the actual leadership change that's coming in November. Because like you just stated previously, you see Gary Gensler bringing forth tons of crypto cases right now. Well, if there's a change in administration, let's say that the SEC decides to appeal. And then in November or December, Gary Gensler resigns because there's a new leader coming in in January, which we're all hoping for on GMC. Would that mean that we could see those cases dropped? Or do you believe that the new SEC chairman has an obligation like what we saw between Jay Clayton and Gary Gensler to kind of bring these cases forward and, and finish what Gary starts? That's a great question. Really important. Um, so we need to remember that Jay Clayton resigned in December of 2020, the next month following Biden's win over Trump. So um, that is the normal course of action 
Uh, that is a tradition in order to make way for the president to pick his own chairman and the party in power is entitled to three commissioners on the five commissioner commission. Um, and so that's what Jay Clayton did. He didn't just step down as chairman. He, he resigned from the commission to open up a, a slot. And that slot was filled with by Gary Gensler. So Gensler, if there is a change in administration, should do the same thing and resign, not just as chairman, but resign from the commission itself, which then would give the next president the opportunity to select someone, um, uh, someone else. Uh, he could promote one of uh, Ueda or uh, Hester Peirce or pick a new one and make that new one the chairman. What we think we know is that Ueda and Purse were not in are not in favor of this, you know, approach of, um, you know, regulation by enforcement. They're, they're not in favor of these cases. So if you add one more person, uh, whether the, they're the chair or just third person and Hester Purse is the chair, then you got three votes of this is not a good idea. And so, would you then continue with all of these cases? I don't think so. I think the cases are damaging to innovation in the United States. Those cases that do not involve fraud, like the Ripple case, Kraken, Coinbase, you know, on and on, they don't, in, there is no investor protection going on. You know, it's just a jihad against the industry because that's what Elizabeth Warren wants. Um, it's not based in the mission of the SEC. And therefore, I believe, you know, a newly constituted commission would think long and hard of either dismissing or settling on very favorable terms these pending cases that don't involve any claims of fraud. Um, I, I can't imagine continuing on. You know, it takes enormous resources. It's taken enormous resources to... Uh, for the SEC to defend the onslaught of Ripple. You know, they were so effective. Um, and so they can divert those resources to better uses where you're actually protecting investors who have been harmed. You know, it's embarrassing that the federal judge finds after years of discovery, the SEC can't find a single person who's been harmed in the Ripple case. You know, that's astounding. All of the time and money and effort that went into the case and they got nothing. The only people that were harmed are the people who are retail XRP holders who were harmed by bringing the case in the first place. It's it's really a, a terrible use of um, SEC government resources and just terrible judgment in the first place to, to do this. When you guys know, and I know, there's plenty of fraud in crypto. I'm an advocate for getting rid of fraud in crypto. I just wish the SEC would, would focus on that. And then they'd have me and a bunch of other people saying, yeah, right on, keep going. But this approach of going after the good actors is crazy. And so I think, and to answer your question, I think a newly constituted SEC would either dismiss or quickly settle many of these cases. It's an interesting discussion, guys. And the one thing I did want to get before we kick it to Johnny Crypto is, James, what is the objective here? That's something that we can openly debate on this channel because I'm not sure anybody has a definitive answer. But there's a reason that the SEC is deciding to go after Ripple. They didn't, they're not attacking the Ethereum Foundation. And for some reason, it's become a consensus opinion that it's totally fine if we never address who Satoshi is. That's another conversation where even guys like Larry Fink are on CNBC right now stating that Bitcoin is the new gold and it's a reserve asset and it's it's a global monetary instantaneous asset. Well, what about the elephant in the room that nobody knows who the founders are? And God forbid this issue happens. But if there was ever a 51 percent attack on the hash rate of Bitcoin, that could lead to an extreme collapse like we've never seen before, not only for Bitcoin, but for all of these altcoins as well. So I know that's a little bit of a tangent there, but my point is. What do you think the objective is from a Gary Gensler or the SEC when they're going after a crypto company? Let's say they get exactly what they're looking for. What do you believe that is from Ripple? The bigger picture is control. It is the theme of a significant uh, number of our elected officials and unelected bureaucrats. They do not want to give up control. 
And so crypto uh, allows, you know, trading outside of banks, you know, and the banks are in there as well. The big banks don't want something going out of their control, you know, so to BlackRock's credit, you know, they quickly understood or not quickly, but they came to understand that if you can't beat them, join them and make money from them. Um, and so that's, you know, the capitalist system. It makes sense that they would do that. But, you know, it's a threat to the JP Morgans and the Bank of America's and the Wells Fargo's and the, all, of the, all of the others um, that they can't control um, our finances, you know, and that's how you control people. If you can control the finances, you control the people. And that's why, you know, you have this discussion of CBDCs because it's the perfect you know, vehicle for government control of the populace. Um, and so this is to me why John Deaton's candidacy is so important because the freedoms that we've taken for granted, you know, in my lifetime, I think are under threat. Um, and the threat this time is not an external threat, another country, but rather the threat within, you know, the defensive perimeter of our own country that people want to take, uh, you know, people in charge want to take control of what we are able to say and write and believe um, and, uh, and how we exchange value with one another. And this crypto is a threat to all of that. And so people who have had power for a long time are not big fans of giving up that power. And they're going to fight like crazy to stop, uh, stop a transfer of power back to the people. Um, and so I think that's that's the motivation here. I agree with you and Johnny Crypto. First of all, I want to say welcome in. Shout out to you, my friend. We got Meta Law Man joining us this morning, so it's been a great episode. How you feeling? And I'll see you in Arizona tonight. So thanks for being here. See you soon. And good morning to all the war maniacs out there. We love and appreciate you guys for showing up every day. Great to see our friend Meta Law Man back on the show. Haven't seen you in a while, buddy. Good to hear you, it's especially after such a great day with John D in the winning, you know, hands down. So that was awesome. And I couldn't agree with you more that basically what we're witnessing. We are literally witnessing the lobbyists weaponizing a three-letter agency to go after their opponents. I mean, that's just what it is in a nutshell. Let's just call it what it is. We know what's going on. They decided, yep, this is a threat. And don't forget, Ripple went and tried to work with J.P. Morgan and some of the other big boys. And the relationship was there and it fell apart. And all of a sudden, the minute it fell apart, bang, the longest lawsuit in history. Actually, I got a question for you, man, Law man. What is the longest lawsuit in SEC history? Is Ripple finally taking the cake on that one. I mean, I mean, I know when we looked at this and we had Jeremy Hogan on two years ago, he looked at it and said, like, most cases on average are subtle. And I forgot the number now, seven months or nine months with the SEC. And this thing was, what, four years almost. So it's, it just shows you that there was clearly an agenda. And the reality is, abs keep saying, you know, they're going to appeal. They're not going to appeal. They're going to win. I said, the reality is, define the definition of win. The SEC's goal here isn't, yeah, it's extract some money out of them, but they, were, they could have done that anytime. The goal here, in my opinion, is to delay, 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 delay. And boy, they have won. The SEC has won when you think if that's their agenda. I mean, we're talking four years now, and the monkey is still on their back. I mean, it's just crazy how long it takes to get the monkey off their back. And 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 so, I mean, if they appeal this thing, whether they win or lose, it doesn't matter if the goal is delay. Because Metal Law, man, if they delay, if they appeal, what are we talking about? Another year before we hear the ending of this thing now? Or, you know, or two years. So there you go. <clears throat> yeah, you, you're spot on. And, and the way I just dis describe it uh, is the process is the punishment. You know, it's not what happens at the end. It's the process itself. When you think about all the attorney's fees that uh, that Ripple uh, has spent. But I think more, even more costly is just the black cloud over the company as it tries to, you know, establish uh, relationships and contracts all around the world. You know, you can imagine, you know, if they're going to Frankfurt, Germany or the Middle East or whatever, that before they get in there, somebody's Ripple, who's Ripple? Aren't they? Isn't there some issue with the SEC? What's that yeah, about? Like, like, don't come near me. You're the, yeah. the SEC's on your back. Don't come near me, right? It, it slows yeah. innovation or, or stifles their adoption, right? 
Yeah. And, and yeah, it's the process is, is the punishment and it's really unfortunate. And I've been a big believer for years. Uh, and I, I've tried to tweet this to elected representatives that if they're going to come up with uh, some new legislation impacting the SEC, one provision they ought to add in there is that the loser pays the legal fees of the winner. Um, or if it's the government, the government pays if they prosecute somebody and they lost the case. And then you get into a, well, what is the definition of a loss? You know, I, uh, the XRP community and Ripple, you'll remember, celebrated the ruling in the summary judgment motion. And the, one of the funniest things I've seen in a long time is when the SEC filed some uh filing with the judge that had 29 pages of tweets where people were celebrating the Torres decision and it really hurt their feelings, you know, that people weren't acknowledging that they won some parts of that summary judgment ruling. That was just hilarious. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, it, it is, it's not right, you know, that a company has got to pay all of these fees, you know, ultimately for a case where there were no victims other than the retail XRP holders who were not parties to the case, except, you know, when John Deaton came in and spoke for them. Um, this one is, is a, in my opinion, is a black mark on, on, the, uh, on the SEC and the case should never have been brought. When is the final date? when they can appeal do we know when that finally october 6 october 6 finally so that's the day we'll know if the monkey's either off their back if the sec says okay we're moving forward or up oh, no we're going to delay and stifle your innovation on adoption for another year or two and keep you tied up in court that's what we're going to find out but i agree with you depending on the administration change if we get one i believe this is all coming from the admin and the lobbyists right and the money maybe we'll see a different a different uh relationship towards crypto from the new chair if we get one if this but we need to see a change in administration and right now boy it's a tight race so so uh <laughs> as many crypto advocates as we could get would be great well james i think you're gonna like this video because this is uh, this is a video involving the narrative that we saw a couple of weeks ago where gary gensler they were supposedly going to be stepping down as chairman moving to commissioner so that one day he could be appointed as the u.s treasury so i thought that was really interesting and this is a very short video You'll understand what I'm getting at after this clip, guys. And we already have 2,408 live listeners here. Show us some love. Smash that like button. Once again, shout out to Meta Lawman for making time for us this morning. Here's what the inside sources at the SEC are stating about Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler's objective against the crypto market. Here we go. I've heard a lot of different things. So according to my sources, inside the SEC, okay. he's toying with the idea of stepping down from the chairmanship role into a commissioner role. Okay. And we're hearing he is entertaining that because he may not be able to get a job anywhere else because he's that unpopular. You know, there was this rumor floating around on the Internet recently that uh, Kamala Harris was considering nominating him to Treasury Secretary. Right. So we're hearing that that actually was planted by Elizabeth Warren. Who actually is the number one nemesis. I think she's number one. Gary Gensler is more so just operating at her direction. Where does one begin and the other end? Though? So, uh, and we're hearing the reason why she did that is because they, they're then planning to do some polling on how did that announcement impact her base? Who do you think would be a candidate for the chair position if Gensler were to step aside? I actually have information on this that I, I'm not at liberty to Come share. On, so you heard it there. Not only are the inside sources talking about the change, but here's the most important thing, James, that I think is that if they already have a name that they're planning on appointing, I guarantee you that person is not going to be the solution to our problems. I've stated for a long time that I think Gary Gensler is going to be used as the fall man here. What do they call it? Like the straw man. They're going to blame Gary Gensler. He's the bad guy. He's the one who's been hurting the industry. We're going to replace him with uh, Larry Gensler, right? Gary Gensler's good twin. Instead of evil twin, he's the good twin. So I did just want to get your thoughts on the entire objective and what it could mean if John Deaton potentially removes Elizabeth Warren. That is the biggest crypto contrarian in America right now. According to herself, she's leading the anti-crypto army. What are some of your thoughts? Well, um, I kind of doubt that Gary is going to step down uh, as chair and it doesn't matter if there's a change in administration, the, uh, the president can fire a commissioner. 
Now, what I just said there is controversial, but uh, because the Supreme Court has never ruled on this issue precisely, but there are um, commentators a lot smarter than me uh, in the Harvard Tech, uh, Regulation Journal and um, at Yale who agree that the president has this authority and doesn't have to even show good cause, although I think there is good cause um, to remove Gary because of all the damage that he's done to the United States. Um, so I think that a new administration would have the option of getting, getting rid of Gary and hide, hiding out as a commissioner, not the chairman, is not going to solve that. If Deaton wins, that message is going to reverberate in, in Washington like you would not believe. Uh, it is There's one thing that politicians care about, and that's getting reelected. That's what they care about. And if, and if Elizabeth Warren is knocked off, I think, you know, if uh, Kamala Harris wins, there's a chance she could she could pick a pro crypto uh, commissioner. That sounds crazy, you know, and I've been extremely skeptical. Uh, but you ask, what if John wins? Well, if John wins. These people aren't stupid. They know that if they put in the equivalent of Gary Gensler and continue the assault on on crypto, they're going to pay a steep price, you know, for that because this industry is mobilized in a way nobody expected. I mean, I've never been involved in politics. This is my first go round just helping out John because I think it's so important that we protect the freedoms that are that are, you know, in at risk here in this country right now and and I know John will fight for those freedoms. Um so you know, there, anything can happen. This is is pretty wild uh to to imagine that uh, we get rid of uh, Gary Gensler. But I think if there's a change of administration, Gary is gone and we're going to have a pro crypto chairman. Um, and by cri pro crypto, I mean getting rid of the fraud that exists in the crypto industry and providing a avenue for the law abiders who are trying to do it exactly right uh, to flourish in this country so that we can grab back the baton of innovation that we've handed over to the EU and Singapore and most recently Qatar and Hong Kong. It's embarrassing. You know, we're our, our whole identity is tied up in we are the innovators here on our shores in the USA, and we have screwed this up beyond belief. Um, so, you know, and then the other thing is hopefully – you know, we get enough um, pro crypto people in the House and the Senate um, that we get some really good legislation that establishes a regulatory framework that everybody can live with and, and that it can thrive under. Yeah, you're not kidding. We definitely have screwed the pooch here when it comes to taking the lead on this thing. I mean, this should have been America as the innovative leader. The interesting thing is a couple things happen here. So, Abs, one of the things you asked was, you know, if John wins, it would be great. Huge news. However, there's still that pool of anti-crypto people or money out there that's probably going to either one or two things going to happen. It's going to find its way, I think, to whoever the next anti-crypto person is to fight the battle. Or I think because <laughs> the other argument to that is I think what, what the other side learned, James, is in this recent upcoming election, as they started looking at the polls, they started saying, holy crap. There's 15 to 20 percent of people for voters. That's a massive number when you're talking voters, when you only need one or two or three percent to win a, blue, uh, a swing state. If there's 20 percent of voters out there and you got one guy that's broke crypto, one that's anti, I think they realize they would have got slaughtered. So what did they do? They changed all their narratives now. Now they're all pro crypto. Kamala's pro crypto. And met with Ripple, met with Circle. And you're hearing all these things. They're out there. I'm 100 percent with you. I'm so skeptical about it. I think they're just saying it to, to garnish those votes and try to win those voters over. However, hopefully they realize it's real. And maybe, maybe what I pray is that there really is truly a change. And they've realized, okay, the time to fight is over. Now it's time to join. 
and we will get a pro crypto chair. But it's one of two options. Either the anti crypto money is going to go somewhere else if she loses, and we're going to continue the battle, or they're going to like, okay, enough is enough. And I don't know what I don't know which one. Those are the two scenarios I see out there. But I'm hoping it's the latter where they've recognized it's time to throw in the flag. It's time to join the party. And the nice thing, if that happens, is A, we'd get a pro crypto chair. But more importantly, we also need regulation. And when we get that regulation, I've heard companies say, no, I, I want to do crypto, but I'm not doing it right now. My competition isn't doing it. And it's not regulated. It's not approved by the SEC. And they're staying away. But man, boy, will the floodgates in, in the switch flip quickly if we get some kind of stable coin or some kind of regulation for crypto that gives guidance to these companies and a pro crypto chair those two things together oh my god you want to talk about a catalyst you want to talk about lighting a match or a rocket you will see this industry fly if we get both those things yeah you know it's 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 funny uh these articles i read now about uh, this you know matchup eating against warren they always get it wrong they say Warren has been fighting for strict regulation of the crypto industry. I wish, I wish she was. She isn't. She's fighting for no regulation of the crypto industry, but rather having Gary just pick names out of the hat and shoot Wells notices over to him. That's not strict regulation of anything. That's idiocy. What we need, she should get behind, you know, the effort in the Senate to develop a, uh, a, a regulatory framework like they've got in most of the rest of the world now, and she can have her input into that. That's the legislative process. That's how our democracy is supposed to work. And it's crazy that all these reporters saying she's insisting on the strict reg. Nah, she don't want any regulation. Just let's Gary let Gary mess with them. Will be funny. Let's do it that way. And and so that that always gets me. I read it in the in the Boston papers this morning, same thing. Uh, and, and that's why guys, I can't wait for the debate. You know, when John calls her out on so many, so many of these things, we haven't talked about, you know, immigration, but, you know, abs, you talked about the American dream and, you know, when so much of the, you know, the government, uh, help is going to people who entered the country illegally, you know who that doesn't impact at all? The top 1%. They really don't care. Doesn't impact them. Uh, but the poor, working poor, the middle class, you know, seeing, you know, the, the uh, schools, you know, being uh, filled, overflowing with, with kids who do not speak English. I spoke to a teacher saying, we don't have the resources to teach them English here. So they just put them in the class and I'm supposed to help them while helping the other kids are, you know, obviously far more advanced in the language and it's slowing um, our educational process down, not just in, you know, Boston where there's a ton, a ton of this going on, but around the country, there are a lot of ripple effects that people are not kind of aware of unless you're talking to the people who are impacted by it. But, you know, John's talking about the community centers that are being shut down, you know, for, for, you know, poor kids who go there after school because their parents are working two jobs, you know, and they have, have some, you know, people watching over them and some safety. Those things are being shut down to create, um, you know, immigration centers. Um, and so there are impacts on, on real people uh, and John is aware of that because that's where he came from, you know, and he knows the importance of these uh, of the services and uh, facilities that the government has provided. And now, you know, they're, they're no longer available to Americans who, you know, are struggling and working really hard um, just to make ends meet. Oftentimes we've stated on our show that identity politics seems to be more important than ever right now. And I think it's the least important issue when you're sitting there and you're casting your vote. Forget about if the man is green, purple, or red. And I like to use those colors because if I use the real colors, people get upset. It doesn't matter what their color is. It matters what their policies are. And so we like to focus on the policies. What really exposed the game for me is that in 2020, we needed $18 billion to build a border wall. And nobody get emotional about this topic because I understand it's not crypto related, but it fits perfectly into what James just stated. 
We needed $18 billion in 2016 to build a border wall, right? Which would have prevented many of the crises that we're dealing with today. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't come to terms on that. You know what we could come to terms with though, James? Printing $4 trillion in stimulus for the economy. And what did that do? It didn't hurt the 1%. It didn't even hurt the top 10%. It hurt everyone who didn't own a home, didn't own a business, didn't own her, didn't own hard assets. And so I think we're seeing that kind of become exaggerated over these next five years. And that's why I think these, these issues are so important. A lot of people like to put politics to the side. And I've often been one of those people who felt like politics was um, maybe just like an emotional discussion. There's no really point in discussing it. But we're at this moment where I feel like leaders have to speak up. And that's why we've decided to talk about this on our channel. Free money is not the solution. $25,000 for to, to put a down payment on a home or giving people uh, UBI, which is what we're seeing come into effect now where they'd like to give people a certain amount of income every month to stimulate their spending. These are not solutions. And where do you spend that money, guys? The money goes to Amazon. It goes to Walmart. It goes to Target. It goes to Home Depot. It ends up in the exact same hands of the people, the 1% that people like Elizabeth Warren are allegedly fighting against. So these issues, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to be an, an economist. Think about it like this. There's 10 cups. Each cup is worth $10. If I double the amount of cups and there's only $10 left, all of those cups have lost half their value. Very, very simple. I just saved you $70,000. Don't go to Harvard. Don't go to some community college. Just show up to Good Morning Crypto, James. So I very much agree with what you're saying. And I think it's something that we can talk about openly because when you're discussing economic policies, there are zero, and I want to repeat this, zero examples where successfully where we've seen unrealized capital gains come into effect, governments telling people price sets or, or price limits, that has never been successful either. And we're not going to you know, go too deep down the rabbit hole, but I do think that's very important. Just to build off what you're saying too as well, because we covered this earlier in the show, Johnny, Warren has already agreed to two October debates with John Deaton. His response countering five debates. He wants five nice. single issue debates. And I think if me and James and you can sit here and talk about these topics, I can't wait to hear what John Deaton has to say on many of these topics. So any quick thoughts there, Johnny, and then we'll continue. Uh, I think it's great. Listen, the debate is the only time you have a chance to call your opponent out because what, what James said earlier is so true is uh, we know that a lot of the, uh, the media skewed and so they write things that aren't true and you can't challenge it or they're on the air saying stuff. There's nobody on the other side to challenge it. This will be his chance. I understand he wants five. There ain't no way she's giving him five because every time she does, she's going to give exposure. If he gets two, I would take it and be happy. But, you know, he's got to make sure he drives the key points home and he will. No doubt about it. John's a super smart guy. Um, I would love to see him get five debates. But I do think, Abs, what we should do when the debate is on, we got we to gotta do a live on the show. Go live. I know. I know. I agree. Say, Let's go live. Hopefully they'll air it and we can find a stream or a link to it and we can watch it live because it would be great to, to see it. I'm going to have my popcorn ready. Let me tell you. I can't <laughs> wait for that debate. You and 75 million other crypto investors, Johnny Crypto. I agree with you there. And James, in case you didn't know, we actually have John Deaton scheduled seven days from now to come on Good Morning Crypto. And we're going to be discussing a lot of these topics. I'm excited because we got a lot of Massachusetts people who watch this show as well. So hopefully there's anybody on the line after that show, they're going to be full supporters of John Deaton. Now, I did just want to get some of your thoughts on this because we're talking about the economy and we only got a couple minutes left. The unrealized capital gains tax, the number one response that we've gotten from this is, don't worry, guys, it's only if, you're, if, it's only if your net is worth over $100 million. Well, who owns all the assets, James? I think that's a pretty simple answer. If you force the largest shareholders, whether it's in real estate or companies, to sell their assets in order to pay government taxes, that's going to hurt the open market. And you know who has exposure to that open market? Probably everybody in our live chat right now. So I'd love for you to expand on that and then say, I just want to say thank you for making time for us today to close out the show. What's your opinion there on what I just broke down? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, anybody who's got a 401k with stock in it uh, or, you know, real estate investment trust, whatever it might be, you know, these people with a hundred million or billion dollars do not have a lot, all that much money relatively in cash to go send it to the IRS. So they must sell. It will be forced selling. And any time you see forced selling uh, by any significant segment uh, of the investing public, it's going to depress um, prices. And we just, it's hard to, I'll be interested to see if some economists come up with how bad it's going to be. Uh, but we know how this works. I mean, many countries have tried this and the, every one of them has abandoned 
it because it just drove capital out of their country. Rich people are very mobile people and they can pick up and get in their yacht and take off, sell their, you know, mansion and move, you know, what assets easily, you know, around. And so um, it, it's like, uh, you know, Kamala says not to be burdened by what has happened or what has been. It's, it's dangerous not to take lessons from history. That's very dangerous. We know this has been tried and it's been a disaster. And so if it were done here before it was abandoned, we you, you guys know exactly what will happen. What will happen is, wow, we didn't get as much money as we thought from the unrealized tax. Let's move it down the, the threshold to 20 million because there's a lot of people between the 20 and 100. And then, then what's gonna happen? Well, you know what? That wasn't as successful as the projections we got uh, from the CBO or IRS or whoever. Let's move it down to people who have $500,000 in assets and get some of their unrealized. That's what happens. You know, that's the mentality of bureaucrats. And so before it's abandoned, much damage will be wrought uh, in this country. And it's amazing that the idea has not been withdrawn, that, uh, that somebody speaking for Kamala reiterated this is really her policy fairly recently. I don't know if that was what you were circling, but I know I saw it. I thought, man, I thought they'd be pulling that back because it's so crazy. But no, um, and apparently, they're serious about it. And so we need people, you know, we don't know who's going to be the next president, but we do know we need good people in Congress who are sensible, who have common sense. And so the people of Massachusetts everywhere have common sense. It is simply common sense to say we need a secure border. You know, everybody gets that. We need a secure border. Immigration is good. Immigration made this country great. My mother immigrated here when she was 19 years old, you know, and here I am, you know. It's good when we're controlling it and determining who comes in. You know, it's been great for this country. This country would never have realized all of the great things we've done for the world and our innovation and all of that without immigration of great people in our country. But uncontrolled immigration means you really don't have a country. And the other common sense thing is people get it. Why prices are out of control? It's because the government's out of control, spending money they don't have. It's simple. It's common sense. And so that's why, despite all the polls and all of the pundits, I think John's going to win because people are, are sensible and understand that what's going on right now cannot continue. It's got to be stopped. And the best person to send it, send in there to stop it is the United States Marine, because he ain't going to give an inch, you know, about what's right for the people of Massachusetts, the people of, of this country. So um, thank you guys so much for ha having me on. I, I, I just, it, I'm still in that 24 hour you know, period of celebrating the win, you know, before you go back to work and, and push toward the next game you got to play coming up in a couple of months. So uh, it's been really been wonderful spending time with you guys. It's awesome to have you here at Metal Law, man. We always appreciate when you make time for us. So I do want to say a special thank you to you as well. Johnny, there's one thing I titled today's episode, RLUSD is launching on XRP in weeks. I am going to have to do a read through of this article. So Metal Law, man, I don't want to take any more of your time. If you do have to run, if you have other obligations, you're more than good. And we do appreciate you making time for us for today. But Johnny, the last thing I want to say in regards to what Metal Law, man, broke down was the... Thank you so much, James. See we appreciate guys. it. And we'll appreciate talk to you again it. soon. Thanks, James. See you again soon. He talked about the muddying of the waters. And I remember there was a clip a few months ago where Gary Gensler was given not only the questions, but answers prior to a congressional hearing from Elizabeth Warren in regards to cryptocurrencies. So I think that just goes to show when she talks about not being able to tell where one begins and the other one ends, that's what they mean at the inside sources at the SEC. Now, guys, we've got 2,738 live listeners here. Thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday. I do want to remind our listeners... We will be traveling Thursday and Friday, but we will be back on Monday. We have a retreat out in Arizona. We're going to be in the woods, so I won't have access to Wi-Fi or else I would be doing the show. You know my commitment to this channel, guys. But I want our listeners to remember this. Next Tuesday, we have Linda P. Jones. Then we have John Deaton. Then we have Fred Rispoli. So next week, we have three amazing guests joining the show, and I'm super excited for all those episodes that we're going to have. 
Let me know in the live chat or comment underneath the video. If you want me to ask John Deaton anything during our interview, I'll definitely pick a couple of questions and I'll even cite the uh, listener who submitted the question. So I'd love for you guys to do that. Now, the breaking news from today, and we titled today's episode, RLUSD is launching on the XRP ledger in weeks. This is breaking news from Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. So the RLUSD will be fully backed by US dollars and tested with enterprise partners to operate on the XRPL and the Ethereum blockchain. And we can actually tie some of this news into the smart contract update that we got yesterday. So Ripple Labs Chief Executive Officer Brad Garlinghouse stated at the Korean Blockchain Week on Wednesday that the company's US dollar peg stablecoin is close to issuance. We will certainly be launching soon, within weeks, not months, said Garlinghouse. It's called Ripple US dollar and RLUSD has been minted within that framework. He stated that plans for the token were made after the US dollar stablecoin USDC lost its market cap and lost its US dollar peg on March of 2023. We felt like there was an opportunity for a credible player already working with lots of financial institutions to lean into this market. Ripple revealed its stablecoin plans in April, stating that the token would be 100% backed by US dollar deposits, short-term US government treasuries, and other cash equivalents. couple sentences here, and we're going to kick it to Johnny Crypto. It began testing the token in early August with enterprise partners, and the stablecoin is scheduled to be deployed on Ripple's institutional-focused XRP ledger, and the Ethereum blockchain, which will be based on the ERC-20 token standard. Plans for the stablecoin come amid further boosts to the XRP ledger framework in the form of uh, Ethereum-compatible smart contracts, which will let users build on chain and issue tokens, among other financial services, just as they do on Ethereum. So very interesting, guys. We're kind of seeing the XRPL transform from an on-demand liquidity, a payments network, into a tokenized and smart contract network. I think that we could see tons of contracts and tons of scalability come into this market over these next 12 months. I'd love to get Johnny Crypto's reaction to that, and then we'll close out today's show. I think that's really the key, Abs, is building use cases and bringing more liquidity and value locks into the system and having your own uh, stablecoin to be able to support those transactions, to be able to support it is important. Also, they're going to do it right. I guarantee you they'll do 100% backed by dollars not like tether which if you recall first of all the audits are hard to get and then when you get an audit it's like oh it's 80 percent dollars and 20 percent commercial property this and that commercial paper like what are you talking about what would be commercial paper right no if it's a back if it's backed by a u.s dollar it should be 100 percent backed by a u.s dollar right um and so we want to see i'm sure ripple will do that right they will make sure it's 100 percent back i'm sure they'll do the audits so people can trust and believe in it and then, of course, as a massive community that will use it. And I think, again, as we talked last night on the Merlin Twitter spaces, I see Ripple branching out and they're, they're trying to find their space or where to play. And there's so many different areas to play. And, of course, real world asset tokenization will be probably the biggest part. And bringing smart contracts to enable some of that, having a stable coin to be able to transfer back and forth. It's, it's just it's, it's really they are really putting themselves in prime position. To win here and so anybody who's a ripple holder or an xrp holder you really really you really have to be excited for the future where we're headed but you also have to be patient and i see a lot of people in our chat you know and i also a lot of people on twitter getting frustrated and you know been in this thing three or four years and they're ready to quit or get out not everybody but I, but i see the comments right some people are and the reality is you just have to understand <laughs> what you own where we are in the process, like I did this in 1997, I owned, owned Amazon, but I didn't realize what I held and I didn't know and I didn't hold it long enough. I was impatient. I took the profit and I ran. Right. Um, so in this case, I ain't, I ain't doing that mistake again. I'm extremely patient. I don't even look at my portfolio barely anymore because I know, you know, I'll, I'll know when the time is right to look at it. But the point being, Abs, is you have to let these technologies grow. You have to let them seed. You have to let them evolve. You have to let them get adopted. And, and, and the world is a big place. There's many, many co countries, companies that are going to adopt these technologies. We don't know who's going to win, but you've got to give it time to happen. But the more technologies you've got out there that solve a problem, the higher probability you have of success. And that's why I'm excited about this news. And think about this just to build off what you stated, and then we'll close it out here, guys. There's, this is an account I love to follow. So it's M. It's S-M-Q-K-E-D-Q-G. So I know that's very difficult. That's why I read it out. But if you guys want to follow some, some interesting content about Ripple, go and check out that account. 
Listen to what he said about the difference between Ripple stablecoin and the US dollar stablecoin launched by Circle. USDC does offer one critical aspect from RLUSD is that Circle does not offer its own blockchain. By being able to offer both the rails, which is the XRPL, and the token that can move along those rails, which is RLUSD for cross-border payment companies, Ripple is positioned to be able to provide a complete solution rather than needing to partner with other companies such as Circle's partnership with MoneyGram. So very interesting. We're seeing both worlds come into effect and kind of separate themselves. USDC is definitely more valid than Tether, but they're stating that even RLUSD has an advantage there. I'm very excited about this news. Any quick statements to close it out, Rhoda? Yeah, no, I mean, again, I think what they've done is provide their own homegrown solution rather than relying on the others. It, to me, I, I get why they did it, and, and we'll see how it plays out, Abs, at the end of the day. We'll see how much traction it gets, how many... Uh, what kind of market cap size it can get out the gate. Um, you know, it might be a little slow because remember that they, they've been slowed down and they have not been able to, to build as we talked about earlier in the show over the past four years, because they've been under a lawsuit. So it may take some time for them to get some traction and grow their stable coin, but uh, you know, we'll see. I, I'm really curious I to see within like a year, what's the market cap of it versus like, you know, I won't be surprised if it, you know, I would expect it within a year to be within you know, the top three to catch up to USDC and to, I mean, Tether's, you know, right now the bigger, but you know, it'd be interesting to see how, how long it takes to get there. Um, but for me, yeah. So let's keep an eye on it and see how it grows. Absolutely. Johnny. And the question that we asked our user poll today is, do you believe the sec will appeal the ripple ruling? 73% voted no 26% voted. Yes. That is out of 547 votes this morning, guys. I want to give a special thank you to everybody who participated in that poll. Special thank you to James metal law, man. And my man, Johnny crypto as well. I want to give a shout out to Gonzo too. We got 2,825 live listeners here joining us. Show us some love, smash that like button. I want to say thank you for joining us for today's episode. I'm going to miss you guys on Thursday. I'm going to miss you guys on Friday. So if you want updates, maybe I'll be on Twitter. We love you guys. Guys, we'll see you in not 72 hours. We'll see you in five days. I mi- I'm going to miss you. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. We love you guys. And we'll see you soon. Like we always say, Warriors, ah, get your shit together, baby. Thanks for joining. Let's go. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer radio show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.